Now I want to take the rest of the time that we have and I want us to look at the basic invitation for men to come to Christ that is most prominent in America today. A standard contemporary invitation. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Do you know you're a sinner? Do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? Did he come in when you prayed? Were you sincere? Then you are now a Christian. Welcome to the family of God. This is such a sacred calf, a golden calf. In the evangelical community today, that I am more attacked for this than anything else. But I assure you, this is not biblical language, and it is not found in the greater part of Christian history. This method that we cannot do evangelism without is neither biblical nor historical, and has led us to exactly what we're complaining about. The greater part of the United States of America claims to be born again. And they are not. The greatest field of evangelism today is found in church buildings. I don't want to say it's found in the church because everyone in the church is truly converted. But in church buildings. And you say, oh, we have a lot of churches, Brother Paul. No, we have a really, we have a large group of nice brick buildings on beautiful yards. But the glory of God has since departed from them and Ichabod has been written across the door. Now let's look at this invitation. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Many times this is accompanied by an explanation of all that Jesus can do for the person. Fix their life, their marriage, their finances, their self-esteem. So you walk up to what we know about a sinner. He is self-centered. He's autonomous. He wants to do his own thing. He has his own dreams. And he is in love with himself. So you walk up to this man and you say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And he goes, what? God loves me? That's fantastic. I love me too. Well, this is wonderful. And you're even saying that he loves me more than I love me? Now that sounds impossible. How could anyone have such a great love? And God has a wonderful plan for my life. Oh, I have a wonderful plan for my life too. And you're telling me that if I accept this Jesus, he will help me with all my wonderful plans and I can have my best life now? Yes. Well, then I'll take a God like that. You got two of them? <laughs> Do you see that? Now you say, Brother Paul, it's, it, we don't mean it that way. That's a, but that's the way it's coming out. Now you're saying, Paul, you're being very hard, full of satire. Yes, I am. I am. But look, everybody is lamenting the fact that this country believes it's saved when it's no more saved than a... It's as lost, as they say in Alabama, as a ball in tall grass. But no one wants to point to what the problem is. And the problem is, even when we preach the gospel correctly, then we go to this thing of how to invite men that's not biblical or historical. We get them to jump through a few evangelical hoops and say yes to the appropriate questions, and we popishly pronounce them to be saved. And when they believe that false religious lie given by a religious authority then when someone comes later and tries to preach the gospel to them because they're living in the world they won't listen because a religious lie has so much power then the next question do you know you're a sinner and oftentimes it's really not given too seriously it's kinda like hey you know we're all sinners don't you And if the person says, yes, I know I'm a sinner, then the question is, do you want to go to heaven? Well, yeah, I do. Then would you like to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? It'll only take five minutes. <laughs> only five minutes? Yes. Because the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them they gave 
to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. So would you like to receive Jesus? Because that's what the Bible says. Only take five minutes? Only five minutes. Sure. And then afterwards, often after a person prays or is led in a prayer by the evangelist, he or she is assured that if they were sincere, then Jesus has definitely come into their heart. Because he promised he would, and if he didn't come in, he's a liar because they were sincere. How many people do you know believe they're going to heaven because they're not trusting so much in Christ as they are the sincerity of the decision they made a long time ago? Oftentimes, after a few minutes of counseling, a few minutes of counseling, they are immediately presented before the church and welcomed into the family of God. Now, you tell me I'm wrong. They come down front. I've seen it so many times. They're given over to a counselor who's been trained in a package counseling form. They're talked to for about five or ten minutes while the invitation rolls on, and then immediately they're presented before the church, our new brother and sister in Christ. And that's the last most of them will ever, ever hear of conversion counseling. And then what will happen? If they never grow, or if they doubt their salvation, they are taken again back to that day when they prayed and questioned regarding the sincerity of their decision. If they ever come to the pastor again doubting their salvation, he'll take them back to that day again and say, well, did you ever pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? Yes. Were you sincere? I think so. Then it's just the devil bothering you. If they never grow in the things of God, their lack of growth is attributed to the lack of discipleship or the belief in the doctrine of the carnal Christian. One, one convention that I know of came to the conclusion that 60% of all its converts never attended church. And their answer for that malady was, we have to do a better job in discipleship. No. Jesus, His sheep, they hear His voice. And they follow Him, whether you disciple them or not. Now, we ought to do discipleship. We ought to do discipleship. My friend, back in the 70s, discipleship became the big thing, personal discipleship. We have just as many people leaving the back door of the church as entering into the front door of the church because we're not doing personal discipleship. No, it's because we're not preaching the gospel correctly and we're pronouncing people converted who are not converted and they went out from us because they never were of us. Now, you've got to understand this. We deal five minutes with a person, their conversion, and then spend 50 years trying to disciple a goat into a sheep. I'm not saying this because I'm an angry person. I'm saying this because I'm angry because countless people are deceived. The problem is not liberal politicians. It's evangelical preachers. If they're ever challenged regarding their conversion because of a lack of fruit or overwhelming worldliness, they defend their hope of salvation by once again affirming the sincerity of their prayer and the confirmation of their religious leaders. If any counseling is done, a person is usually admonished to turn from his or her backsliding and to begin serving the Lord again. However, the validity of their conversion is never examined or ever challenged. So many people, for example, children evangelism. I would not let my child attend 98% of the Sunday school classes and vacation Bible schools in this country. And I'll tell you why. A bunch of children are brought in and they're told wonderful stories about Jesus. And then, how many of you children love Jesus? I mean, except for the kid in the back with the leather jacket and the signs on his back that have been imprinted by a cultic, you know, satanic cult. Every, other, every kid in that class is going to stand up and go, I love Jesus. Well, how many of you want to go to heaven? Oh, I do. How many of you want to pray this prayer? I will. And then they're marched off to baptism. And a lot of times the baptismal is dressed up like some kind of a happy party time with graffiti so that they really enjoy it. And then when they're old enough to rebel against their parents, they do. And they live in gross immorality and sin. And then when they're about 25 or 30 after college, they decide they need to straighten things out because morality is really a better way to go. So they rededicate their life and they continue attending church once a week, having just enough morality to dim their conscience and send them straight to hell. 
That's what's going on. And when little Johnny wanders off the path and begins sleeping with his girlfriend, taking drugs, selling drugs, doing everything else, his mother and his father and his pastor goes to him and says, you're a Christian, so you need to stop living that way, instead of saying this, you made the profession of faith in Christ, you were baptized in His name, and for a while it seemed that you did walk with Him, but now you have turned away from the faith and you have proved possibly that you never knew him and you've been reprobate from the beginning. Repent and believe the gospel. Flee from the wrath to come. That's the difference.